CBC's ratings plummet. They're still receiving more tax dollars than ever. Justin Trudeau contradicts himself, joins the Trump derangement team, and blames the United States for Iran's reckless incompetency. A social justice mob goes after a celebrity for being too polite. And it's Wednesday, so we will do fake news of the week. I'm Candace Malcolm, and this is The Candace Malcolm Show. Hi, thank you so much for tuning in. I know I've been focusing this show so much on Iran, so I'm going to lead with something a little different today. This is an exclusive from Blacklock's reporter that was picked up by Post Millennial and TNC.News. The CBC's ad dollars have fallen by 37%. So this is from Blacklock's. The CBC confirms its English language TV ad revenues fell by more than a third last year, with fewer than 1% of Canadians watching its local suppertime newscast. The Crown broadcast in its latest annual report questioned whether it can remain sustainable without more subsidies. So fewer Canadians than ever before are watching the CBC. So Canadians are just not tuned in. They're not interested in what the CBC is pushing, which is a very far left anti-American worldview. Canadians by and large reject that kind of nonsense and they're not watching it. Less than 1%, fewer than 1% of Canadians are watching the CBC every night. And at the same time, the CBC's ad dollars are falling, so companies are less and less interested in advertising on the CBC, and yet they're still receiving $1.2 billion in annual subsidies courtesy of you and me and the rest of the Canadian taxpayers out there. And at the same time, the CBC is still asking the government for more money, saying that their entire funding model is not sustainable and that they're going to need yet another bailout, more and more money from the Canadian taxpayer in order to sustain. You know, it's just, it's so mind boggling that this entity exists in Canada. You know, this is a time where digital media outlets are thriving, where new startups like TNC.news or like the Post Millennial or even some on the left, you know, Canada Land, Press Progress, um, the National Observer, there are all these new digital media outlets that are successful that have found a successful funding model that Canadians are interested in that are, sort of serve a niche audience. And, it, you know, we're all making it work. We're, we're, we found a sustainable funding model, whereas this sort of behemoth state broadcaster that has no clue what Canadians want, that never really has to think or consider what to do to make Canadians more interested in their broadcast. All they have to do is go hat in hand to the prime minister and beg him for more money. And if uh, the past is indicative of the future, uh, Trudeau will always say yes to the state broadcaster. You know, this reminds me of this uh, little moment on the campaign trail where Justin Trudeau flat out stated why uh, you know, him and the liberals love the CBC. Let's play that clip. This is for you, David. This is for you. No, 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 no. I mean, hey, uh, Liberal Party always supports the CBC. So we know that Justin Trudeau loves the CBC. We know the liberals are always there for the CBC, as he said. So I wouldn't be surprised if the liberals came up with even more money to subsidize the CBC. You know, this is just so unfortunate because Canadians don't want this. It's bad for the country. The CBC is so biased. They're so off in their editorial position that they have a negative impact on the country. They harm the entire country, and yet we're the ones funding it. It's it's so frustrating. Uh, let's read more from this Blacklock's report. It says English TV ad revenues fell 37% from 178 million to 112 million. French language ad revenues declined 3% from 140 million down to 136 million. The total audience for 6 p.m. local TV newscasts at 27 CBC stations nationwide was 319,000 people, the equivalent to fewer than 12,000 nightly viewers per city. Uh, that's less, that's, that's fewer people than listen to this podcast. The total market share for the CBC TV main network was 5% down from 8% the previous year. The CBC News Network cable service has a 1.4% market share. So whichever way you look at it, whichever way you cut it, the CBC is flailing and failing. And really, it's time to just let the CBC go. I'm not totally opposed to having some kind of a national state broadcaster, maybe something more in the package of NPR, which is you know, a smaller entity that doesn't dictate the entire media landscape in the United States, um, but they have thoughtful programming and they're funding not only from the taxpayer, but also through their own sort of fundraising initiatives and grassroots fundraising, you know, something like that. 
I'm not completely opposed to it. I'd prefer to have just a total free market. But if we're going to have some kind of a state broadcaster, look at the NPR model. The CBC is just so nonsensical, especially when there are so many CBC reporters, for instance, in the parliamentary press gallery, that they literally dictate the direction of the news story. Look at Justin Trudeau's press conferences on the Iran plane crash, which we will get to in the show. You know, question after question after question from those CBC and Radio Canada and CBC French, all the different CBC reporters asking in the same line of reasoning because it was their editorial position. Isn't the U.S. to blame? Is the U.S. to blame? Do you blame Trump? Trump, Trump, U.S., U.S. And it, it sways the entire coverage and it even sways the thinking of the politicians who are getting pestered with these far left deranged questions. Uh, that, 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 that's the sort of outcome. So, you know, CBC is having a very negative impact on our country and it's time to pull the plug one reason I really hope that conservatives win next time around is just on this issue. I hope that the conservatives choose a leader who is courageous enough to say the truth about the CBC and pledge to defund the entire entity and that they, that they win the election just so they can do that one thing. I think that would be great for the country and worthwhile. Uh, all right, let's move on. Justin Trudeau has completely contradicted himself. So if you recall, on Saturday, he gave a press conference. Iran took responsibility for the downing of that plane crash after spending several days lying. At first, they said it was engine failure. Then they said that someone else must have shot them down. Uh, they finally took responsibility. Justin Trudeau gave a very firm uh, press conference on Saturday, firm for him. He still wasn't perfect. He still made some fumbles and he wasn't as tough as possible. Reporter after reporter, especially those CBC and Radio Canada reporters, kept asking him if he thought that the U.S. was to blame. He actually pushed back and was pretty firm for him, made it clear that he didn't believe the United States was at fault, repeatedly said that it was Iran, it was Iran, it was Iran. I uh, put together a little montage of him, you know, the best parts of Trudeau pushing back against the media and clearly explaining that it was Iran to blame. What Iran has admitted to is very serious. Shooting down a civilian aircraft is horrific. Iran must take full responsibility. Should Iran compensate Canadian families here? Uh, that is certainly uh, something that uh, is uh, going to need to be part of the mix. But Iran is still pointing some fingers at the United States, as are many others, for raising tensions in the first place. Do you share those views and do you plan to speak with the U.S. president and, and discuss it? The reality is there have been uh, significant tensions in that region for a long time. Many of these families have fled Iran fled the regime, tried to build a better life for them elsewhere and to have uh, the regime that they have left behind um, accept responsibility for this is a, a bitter pill indeed. I'm wondering if you think that uh, the Iranian system may now find uh, a culprit, blame them, prosecute them without the international community. I think there is a, a recognition that there is uh, probably uh, individual culpability in this situation, but there is also a, a system-wide culpability, and the reflections around that is something that the uh, Iranians and indeed the international partners will be engaged with uh, over the coming weeks as we unfold in this investigation. So he makes it pretty clear. He says that he believes that Iran should probably compensate the families, which shows that he believes that Iran is the one that's to blame. He says, when asked specifically, do you think the recent tensions in the region caused this plane crash? He, he said no. He said, let's be clear. There's been tensions. There's been significant tensions in that region for a long time, which is absolutely correct. You know, those who are just looking at the death of Soleimani uh, are missing, you know, the last, not, not even just six months of history, the last 40 years of history. But even if you're just looking, you know, a couple of days before Soleimani was killed in that attack, in that drone strike by the U.S., you know, he had ordered an attack on a U.S. base, on an Iraqi base where U.S. and Canadian troops were held, an American citizen was killed. That was what really set off this recent chain of events. If you go back, you know, a little further than that, uh, you'll know that uh, Iran shot down an American drone in international airspace over the summer. They seized a British naval ship. Um, that was also an international seas. They bombed a Saudi oil facility, knocking out about 5% of that country's oil production. Um, and then they, sh they attacked these bases. So there are several examples of Iran being the aggressor in this region that really led to the, es the recent escalations. And Trudeau rightly acknowledged that. Uh, he made a point that many of the people who were on that plane had fled the regime, that they thought that the evil regime in Iran was behind them. 
he didn't say evil, they fled the regime and that they thought that they had escaped the regime, which again, not only shows that Iran was to blame for the crash, but also that they're this evil oppressive regime that caused all these people to flee. And then at the very end there, he was talking about how there's probably individual culpability, but also a system wide culpability. So all of that is to say, you know, no matter which way you look at it, whether you're looking at tensions in the region, that was caused by Iran. Whether you're looking at, you know, the, the, the regime's capability to do evil and, and why so many people flee it, he acknowledged that, which, you know, that's about as far as I've ever seen Trudeau go on Iran. And then the, the, what he talked about, the system culpability. You know, this was an evening where Iran was launching an offensive. They were bombing Iraq at night. Remember, they said that they were going to seek revenge for the death of Soleimani. This was the night that they were doing it. They were bombing Iraq. They weren't being bombed that evening. So, so many questions, uh, you know, come up. Why was uh, the commercial airspace open? Why were commercial planes still allowed to come and go? That was the decision, again, of the government, of the Iranian government, the plane was taking off from Tehran. The planes probably should have never been allowed to take off, given that Iran was launching this bombing campaign to neighboring Iraq. You know, there's also several other questions about, you know, why one individual was in the position where they were allowed to make that terrible, terrible decision to press that button and launch a missile. Uh, according to Iran's own explanation of what happened, it was a junior person. He didn't have the training. He only had 10 seconds, they said. They devised this crazy scheme where he only had 10 seconds uh, to determine whether or not to shoot down the plane. And he said that he tried to reach out to his higher ups, but the lines were jammed. So, you know, Iran has lied about this. Everything they said about the scenario doesn't make sense. And no matter which way you look at it, it was an Iranian missile launched by the Iranian regime um, from Iran, you know, in a situation where Iran was bombing, was on the offensive, and their airspace should have never been open. So, you know, for all the components involved here, Almost all of them are directly responsible uh, by Iran, and Trudeau was pretty clear about that. But then just two days later, just two days after he gave this pretty strong press conference, he goes on to Global, and he does an interview where he pretty much just says the exact opposite. Do you think that the people who died on that plane are collateral damage in the tensions between Iran and the U.S.? I think if there were no uh, tensions, if there was no uh, escalation recently in the region, uh, those uh, Canadians would be right now home with their families. So that is the derangement view. That is the Trump derangement view, uh, which was the exact opposite. You know, on Saturday, he said there's tensions for a long time. And on Monday, he said if it wasn't for those recent tensions, which we know he's talking about the uh, drone attack on Soleimani, if it wasn't for those recent tensions, those Canadians would be home by their families. So, you know, most serious people in the world are on the side of, you know, this is clearly Iran's responsibility and we need to be tough against them and this is totally unacceptable and reckless and evil. And then there's a small component of people who just hate Donald Trump so much, they're so partisan, they can't get over their deep hatred for Trump that everything that happens is his fault. And, you know, there's a broader group of people that are just anti-American in general. And their worldview is that America is this horrible, evil place and that everything they do is wrong. And Trudeau just sort of went from you know, one camp over to the other camp. It's very embarrassing. Trudeau just flip-flopped and basically said the opposite. And really, you know, the, tr the, the, the worldview that you have to have to say that the U.S. is at fault for Iran's bad behavior, it's so deranged. Okay, let's move on. <laughs> there was a lot of outrage, a lot of outcry over a clip. Uh, President Trump and the First Lady Melania Trump were at a football game, a college football game down in Louisiana. He got a huge applause. Watching Donald Trump step out on the field, you kind of see Trump has this like huge backing. It's sort of like a cultural phenomenon. So he walks out, the crowd goes crazy, people are chanting the USA, USA, really, really uh, over the top uh, you know, welcome from the crowd there in Lu at Louisiana State. Uh, a video surfaced of Trump in the crowd later and during the game, and he's there with Vince Vaughn, actor Vince Vaughn, who's a pretty big celebrity. And you can see Vaughn and Trump talking, and their exchange sort of ends with a handshake. So because of that, there's sort of this huge reaction online. Everyone knows that Vince Vaughn is a Republican. He's been conservative for a long time. Uh, but you know, they just, the, the mob, the left-wing mob, social justice warriors just can't handle seeing a celebrity being nice to Donald Trump. So there's a huge 
outcry. I don't know exactly how much of it was organic. I think some of it was a joke that led uh, from a, um, a tweet from someone at the Washington Examiner who was kind of joking around. But anyway, if you look at the clip, if you watch the video, it doesn't actually seem like a super friendly exchange. From my reading of it, me watching it, it seems like Vince Vaughn is sort of telling Donald Trump his opinion on something. Like he's almost criticizing Trump. He's saying, blah, blah, blah. I don't like what you're doing. You should consider changing this. And Trump kind of like, kind of gives it like a, a little, okay, I, I, I respect you for saying that or whatever, a kind of little head shake and a handshake. Uh, it's not like a super friendly, like back, back slapping kind of interaction. It seems like a little bit more tense. We don't obviously know what was said because there's no audio, but looking at the video, looking at the interaction, you could actually imagine that Vince Vaughn was sort of telling Trump off or criticizing Trump. Um, and yet that doesn't matter because all the deranged left saw uh, was a celebrity being nice to Trump and that led to typical Trump derangement online. All right, it is Wednesday, so we're gonna do fake news of the week. This comes courtesy of, you guessed it, the CBC, the state broadcaster, you cannot trust to tell the truth. Okay, so CBC politics tweeted out, Harper says regime change needed in Iran to bring peace to the region. CTV followed suit and put out a very similar piece saying Harper calls for Iranian regime change in wake of downed jet. Now, the only problem with all that is that that's not what Stephen Harper actually said. And calling for regime change is like very specific. It is a very specific meaning and it's pretty aggressive. Like it's something that most politicians wouldn't do. Uh, me, on the other hand, I would openly say that Iran needs re regime change. They obviously need regime change. They're led by a group of evil mullahs who are not only evil but incompetent, as we've seen over the past several weeks. Uh, but that's not what Stephen Harper said. Stephen Harper is more diplomatic than I am. And, uh, unfortunately, the CBC just doesn't always you know, report the truth, as is the case here. It was pointed out by the National Post's Chris Selly. He tweeted out that regime change has very specific meaning and Harper doesn't even remotely allude to that. In the passages quoted here, even Gerald Butts, even Justin Trudeau's BFF uh, came to the defense of Stephen Harper and said, I'm not in the business of defending Harper, but he didn't use the phrase regime change in this interview. It's a loaded term to say the least. So after being called out for misrepresenting what the former conservative prime minister said, CBC sort of did a little mea culpa here and said the headline and lead paragraph of this story have been edited from a previous version that says Stephen Harper said regime change was needed in Iran. In fact, Harper said, I do believe we need to see a change in Iran if we are going to see peace in the Middle East. He also said, I think without a change in the nature of the government in Tehran, the Middle East will continue to be in turmoil. That's not exactly calling for a change of government. He's just saying that there needs to be a change, which could potentially be a change within the government. Again, I would prefer to be a change of government, but that's not what Harper's saying. So, you know, the CBC is manipulating the words of a former prime minister to make them more loaded, to make them more controversial than they actually are, to probably anger a lot of people in Iran who are thinking, you know, why is Canada talking about whether or not we need a change in government? Um, that's not the role of a former prime minister. So shame on the CBC for trying to push that in life. They hadn't have been called out so publicly by that national post reporter, they probably would have just continued to be pushing out this nonsense. Again, that's $1.2 billion of your taxpayer money going to further divide the country and pit Canadians against each other by lying about what a politician says. Okay, I'm going to leave it at that. Thank you so much for joining in. Thank you for tuning in today, and we will be back next week.